a demonstration. Alexander ordered his men to line up in a single file line and start marching. And they began to, to march straight toward the edge of a cliff. And the townspeople gathered on the city wall and the king, and they watched in silence as one by one the soldiers, without hesitation, marched off the edge of the cliff to their death. They were shocked. And by the end of it, after ten soldiers marched to their death, Alexander ordered the rest of the men to return to his side. The townspeople and the king immediately surrendered to Alexander the Great. They realized if a few men were acting, were actually willing to die at the command of this leader, then there is nothing that could stop them from victory. What an astonishing story. It, and in, on the surface, it really makes no sense why some men would be that committed. This kind of obedience, this kind of surrender is unheard of. But in our text this morning, we will see one of the greatest tests of faith ever. God tests Abraham. And even worse than God telling Abraham to take his own life, as God did with his own son, even worse than that is God telling Abraham to kill his own son. What a great test. Alexander's the, the great soldiers were willing to give their life for Alexander. Are we willing to give our everything for King Jesus? What a great test we will see this morning with Abraham. Beloved, God will test you. It's a fact. God will do things in your life that you cannot comprehend, and he will test you. But he will not call you to do something outside of his will. And he will not call you to do something that he will not provide a way for you to fulfill that great task. The, and the title of the message goes hand in hand and from verse 14. The Lord will provide. And as we begin to wrap our heads about the tests of faith that we will, we will see in this passage, the Lord will provide, uh, let's begin looking at verse 1. It says, After these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. After these things, after what things? Well, I guess we could say a culmination of all the the ministry that we have in the scriptures of Abraham, beginning in Genesis 12. This pagan man from a pagan land, Ur of Chaldea, called by God. Abraham takes his family, his possessions, and, and goes to the promised land. He arrives there. There's many trials. God promised Abraham that he would have a son, but after waiting for years, Abraham became impatient. He took Hagar, and they had a son called Ishmael. But Ishmael wasn't the promised son, and, and God would eventually, after 25 years, provide Abraham, in Abraham's old age of 100 years old, the promised son, and his name is Isaac. Now, the word Isaac in Hebrew means laughter. So after this long anticipation the son is finally here. The joy that filled their lives must have been monumental. And I can only imagine after Isaac's birth that every night Abraham may go outside and look at the stars and say, Abraham's the first one, but there are going to be many, many other descendants to come. So Abraham's finally born. And it is after these things that God tests 
Abraham. And I, I do want to emphasize this in the text, although some versions, like the King James Version, says God tempted Abraham. The right understanding is that God tested Abraham. There's a big difference between a test and a temptation. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. God will test us. But, J- but verse 13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am be- being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So God will test you, but he will not tempt you. So here's the definition for temptation. It is the pressure to give in to ungodly influences that lead us away from God and into sin. It is not God's will that we fall into sin, church. And why would he put us in a position to have us drift away from him? Temptation. What what tempts us? What are some things that tempt us? Well, James 1 tells us uh, our sinful desires. 2 Peter 2 says that other people tempt us. We know Satan tempts us. These things are not of God. God does not tempt us, but God will test us. Martin Manser, he defines testing this way. The means through which the genuineness of faith is proved and Christian character developed. That's good, isn't it? A test has a purpose. Will you pass the test? The test, the purpose is to prove and to grow in our faith. So God does test, and here he comes to Abraham, and he tests him, and he says, Abraham, Abraham, and what does Abraham say? Here I am. Throughout this chapter, when Abraham, the only words that he says to God, this one Hebrew word, the only word he says is, here I am, Lord. We see that throughout the scripture. Isn't that the appropriate response, the first and appropriate response to God in every way when he says something to us? When he calls us, when he wants us to do something, why shouldn't we just say, here I am, Lord? Use me. A statement we should all be willing to say, but that's easier said than done. God tests Abraham, and verse 2 tells us about this test. He says, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Three times in this chapter, God says, take your son. Take your son. Take your son. Your only son. Your only begotten son. Now, I think if God said, take one of your sons, Abraham might have went and got Ishmael. But that's not the case. The text tells us which son is his only son, and it says, your only son, Isaac. Now, we know he had Ishmael. This is no mistake. God calls the son by name Isaac, but the Hebrew word here for for the only son refers to not number, but value. Isaac is the promised son, the promised seed. And God tells Abraham, take this son, bring him to Mount Moriah, and offer him as a burnt offering. Now, Mount Moriah is an interesting place as you trace it throughout the scriptures. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, it's the place where, where God revealed himself, appeared to David on the threshing floor. Mount Moriah is the place where Solomon built the first temple before it was destroyed by King 
Nebuchadnezzar. And Mount Moriah, uh, theologians believe, is the same place, the same place that we know today is called Golgotha. The place where Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. And he brings him to Mount Moriah, a certain place of great significance. Now I was curious how old Isaac was at this time. In chapter 21, verse 34, it says, And Abraham sojourned for many days. Now most when they tell this account, Isaac tends to be kind of younger, right? A young boy. Well, the, the Madrash rabbi, the Jewish oral tradition of the Jews, they state that Isaac was, get this, 37 years old. But several other commentators have years. Leopold says he was 18 to 20 years old. The early church historian Josephus, very credible, says Isaac was 25 years old. Adam Clark, one of my favorite commentators, he says Isaac was 33 years old. Jameson Fawcett and Brown says he was 20 years old. Th this tends to, to let us know and understand that Isaac wasn't a young boy, as most tend to think. If he was 12, he was a strong 12 because he journeyed three days, he climbed up a mountain, and this entire time he had wood on his back, right? That's something a mature young man could do. Whether he's 12 or 37, I know this, Abraham was old. And the only way that he was able to tie him up was because Isaac allowed him to do that. So this test of faith, this three-day journey is significant. This test of faith by the father of faith to sacrifice his only son, the promised son. Now, our God does not believe, or God, God does not do anything with human sacrifice. So this is unheard of. God has never done this, had a human sacrifice, and never had done this. So it is quite interesting that Abraham was so willing. But why did God test Abraham this way? Have you ever been tested by God? Has God ever tested you in such a way that you couldn't comprehend the reason for the test? Sure, we all have. There's been times in our lives with, when God worked, he asked us to do something, and it made no sense. But that's how God works, right? When it doesn't make sense, we depend on him more. I, I remember when I was 16 years old, I went on a mission trip to Guatemala. Um, we didn't, my family didn't have the funds to go, so the church sent me, had a great time, and I came back to my church, and uh, I just on fire for the Lord. I, and I told my pastor, man, I, I feel the Lord's leading me to some kind of ministry. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what it was. So you know what he did? He said, I want you to preach. And they talk about a test for me. Uh, a young man who, who couldn't speak, you know, that's impossible. I'm an introvert. I'm not gifted that way, barely able to hold a, a conversation in a small group. But I said yes, and I preached. I, I may got an A for effort, but the sermon was horrible. It was short. Now, I know some of you like short sermons. Amen. But I said yes, and I did it. But for me, in that instance in my life, it was hard. How could God use me that way? And, and throughout my life, God has 
done so with me and my family, just moving and ministry. God will tell us to do the impossible, the incomprehensible. And as my pastor tested me, I'm able to do that with other young men and see the impossible happen in people's lives even today. But why test Abraham this way? I, I believe it's this. Maybe Abraham was tempted or tested this way by God to see if Abraham loved Isaac more than God himself. He'd been longing for this son. But we can't love the blessings of God more than God himself. We must put God first. And we must have faith when he tests us. Well, let's, let's jump into to verse 3 and see the trust to obey. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together, and when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac. His son, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. The trust to obey. It is one thing to say we trust God. It's another thing to do what he says. Anyone can say you believe in God, you trust God. But it's another thing to have faith in these circumstances. Often we give lip service with our mouths, we say things, but our lives show something completely different. But Abraham trusted God. We, we don't have any indication here that God had convinced Abraham to do anything. He didn't have to be talked into this. I'm sure Abraham had tons of questions. He, God didn't have to reason with him. Even when it seemed impossible, Abraham obeyed. He got up early in the morning. He saddled his donkey. He cut the wood. And I'm sure as he was cutting the wood, he realized in every chop of cutting the wood, every swing of the axe, he knew what that wood would, would be used for to sacrifice his own son. His own son. This over a hundred year old man chopped the wood. And he journeys three days and and we talk about the faith of Abraham here, but what about the faith of Isaac? What about the faith of Isaac? He questions his father in verse 7, where's the lamb? And Abraham couldn't say this, son, you're the lamb. He said, the Lord will provide. And he gets on the altar. A hundred-year-old man is not going to make a young man get on the altar. So, so Isaac, obedient to his father, obedient to God, gets on the altar. He wouldn't be able to bind him up unless he willingly did that and willingly submitted to his father, and he was bound up. And he was obedient. Even Isaac had faith in this story. This kid, this, this man... Kids like this don't come around very often, do they? They are raised and they are taught to have this kind of immediate God first. Just think of both of their faith. Abraham's faith, he believed and trusted God's word. 
Now, as Abraham's going to the mountain, as he's preparing Isaac, how did he think God was going to keep his promise? Because remember, God didn't promise one son. He promised that from him, this son Isaac, the entire nations, nations would come. Well, Hebrews chapter 11 gives us an indication of what Abraham was thinking. Hebrews eleven seventeen By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. But he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did not receive him back. Abraham said this, God, you're faithful, and if nothing else, you will raise Isaac from the dead. That's what Hebrews says. That's what Abraham believed. He didn't know everything, but he knew something. The main thing is that God will provide. I'm sure he had tons of questions. Was it difficult? Yes. Was it hard? Yes. But true obedience to God says even when we don't have all the answers, we simply say, here I am, Lord. Here I am. And even when God's instructions are hard, here I am. Let's read verses 10 to 14 and see this timely substitute. The, the, then Abraham reached out his hand and took his, the knife to slaughter his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. Seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, and it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Abraham by faith, lays out his son, takes the knife. The knife is raised. And at the very last moment, the last second, the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ himself, Abraham, Abraham, stop. Don't sacrifice yourself. He says, I know now. I know now. What does that mean? He passed the test. I know now that you fear me. You passed the test. And he laid aside his doubts. Abraham laid aside his fears. And he put God first. Abraham proved his faith, his love for God. But what a timely substitute. At the last moment, a sacrifice was needed, and the Lord provided. Well, let's read the, the final portion of our passage. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be gathered because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. Now after these things it was told to Abraham, Behold, Milcah also had born children, to your brother Nahor, who's his firstborn, but his brother Kimuel, the father of Aaron. Chased Hazo, Pildash, Jildath, and Bethuel. Bethuel fathered Rebekah, 
These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. Moreover, his concubine, whose name was Ruma, bore Teba, Gaha, Tahash, and Magog. Hopefully I didn't butcher those names too bad. Once again, God affirms his promise. Because what you've done, Abraham, you will be blessed. And Abraham gets what? What do we have here? A genealogy began to unfold. Names. Descendants of Abraham. And it, it, it even goes further than that. It says, Bethuel fathered Rebekah. That means that Rebekah is related to Abraham and Isaac, and Rebekah would be the wife of Isaac. And, and if we recall, we'll look forward in the future in the text, we'll see that Isaac did the same thing with Rebekah that Abraham did with Sarah. Tell them, it's my sister. Like father, like son. Church, the treasure of blessings, we want God to bless us, right? Blessings are good. If you serve the Lord, you will be rewarded for your faith. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens, Ephesians chapter 1. But God must come first. Maybe you've seen the, the picture of the umbrellas for the life of the Christian. One umbrella, there's another one, there's another one. God is always on top. And other, other, under that, that's the husband and wife. Then you have children. We must have priorities in life. But God must always come first. If he's not first, then he's in the wrong place. God must be first. This is the greatest commandment, is it not? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. Abraham was tested to have found faith. We have looked at Abraham, we have looked at Isaac, but we would miss the point of this entire passage because the clear picture here is of our Lord Jesus Christ. As Isaac was the promised son, Jesus too was the promised son. As Isaac was named by God, Jesus was named by God. Isaac, the son of Abraham, to be sacrificed, rode a donkey. Jesus entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on a donkey. Isaac carried the wood to Mount Moriah. Jesus carried the cross to Golgotha. Isaac journeyed three days to his death. Jesus died and was in the grave for three days. Isaac was placed on the altar for a sacrifice. Jesus was sacrificed and the final and better sacrifice, better than bulls and goats. Isaac had a substitute for his death, but Jesus is the substitutionary atonement for our sins. Jesus is the true Savior. Consider these verses about the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. Ephes Isaiah 53, verse 4 to 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is called the great exchange. When Jesus died on the cross, our sins, the wrath of God which was to be upon us, was placed upon the Son of God, the sinless Son of God, the spotless Lamb. And to all who believe in the Lamb of God and place their faith in Him, they receive the righteousness of Christ. 
He received something he did not deserve, the sins of the world, and we received something we do not deserve, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Therefore, therefore, as we stand before a holy God, God does not see us in our sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. The Lord will provide. We are all sheep who have gone astray. The Lord will has provided a Savior. He has come. But we must put God first. Maybe a good question to ask the Christian in this place. What is the Isaac in your life? What is it in your life that you are not willing to give up? What is that idol that thing that is keeping you from loving God with all your heart, soul, mind. and spirit. I just encourage you to, to surrender it all to Jesus. Surrender it all. The Lord will provide. Church, it's all about Jesus. As the hymn goes, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that, O cross, where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners were slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. And I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Beloved, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we began our service. I implore you on behalf of Jesus Christ, be reconciled to God. As the music begins to play, if you need to, to talk to me, if you need to pray, if you want to learn more about what it means to be a Christian, I'm here for you. These altars are open. As the accompanists come, would you stand with me?